Okay, folks. Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's Marketing Manager, speaking to you from Hampshire, and I'll be your host for this evening. Now, we started running these webinars, online webinars, back in the winter of 2020, 2021, when we were all in lockdown in lieu of our in-person events across the UK. And we continued them in the winter since, and we're delighted to be back for another season, both online and back in person this winter at nine venues across the UK, where we've got fresh destinations and new speakers lined up for you. So further details can be found in the links that you'll receive in your email following this presentation evening. So kicking off tonight is my favorite subject, the wildlife cruises. Now, despite being the marketing manager for Nature Trek, my background is in wildlife guiding at sea. And I've actually just got back from guiding our Bali to Komodo cruise three weeks ago, which I'll be talking to you all about tonight. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with our cruises, almost all of them are private charters. And this means we have total control of the vessel. We fill it with like-minded enthusiasts and we crew it with wildlife expert guides. And importantly, they depart at the right time of year for wildlife. Furthermore, they're small boat charters. The word cruise often connotates images of huge cruise liners with 2,000 passengers on board. Well, not on a nature trek cruise. Depending on the size of the vessel, we have anywhere from 14 to 25 guests. However, our polar cruises are a little bit larger, taking 50 to 100 clients. So you get a much more intimate experience and a good ratio of clients to Nature Trek leaders. And tonight we're going to be going from the polar regions to the warm tropics of Indonesia and Baja. So as usual, please feel welcome to use the chat section, which is at the bottom of the screen on a PC or at the top of your screen on an iPad. For those of you on smaller screens, such as an iPad, if you find any of the chat messages distracting, you can mute the chat by tapping the little bell icon. Furthermore, please do ask any questions you have using the Q&A section on your screen. Please do pop the questions in here rather than in the chat section, just so we don't miss it. We'll type replies to you throughout the evening, but we'll also read out questions at around 9.05 after the last presentation. So I hope you're all sitting comfortably with your feet up and a glass of wine and some nibbles. And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Paul, who's going to take us to the Falklands, South Georgia and Antarctica. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so I'm going to kick off uh, the evening with um, a few images on our cruise down to down south to the Falklands, South Georgia and the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and our next charter is going to be January 2024. I've not seen that uh, that far away, a couple of months or so away. Uh, but we've still got a few berths available. So if you, if you feel like a, a, a last minute holiday, somewhere exciting, then you know, please do join us. Um, we only operate these full charters down to Antarctica every, every few years or so. So it's not something we tend to do every single year. Uh, so if you're particularly keen on, on seeing the penguins and the albatrosses of, um, of the region, then please say do join us in, in January 24. Um, but the cruise that we, we operate is um, an 18-night voyage. Um, it's a 23-day holiday in, in total. We fly from the UK, of course, down to Buenos Aires in um, Argentina, the capital of Argentina, and then from there, take a flight down to Ushuaia, um, the southernmost city in the world, down on the southern tip of Argentina and Tierra del Fuego. We hop on our ship there. But I'll show you the um, details of the ship in a bit. It's feel tedious. And we cruise out to the Falkland Islands, across to South Georgia, and then um, down to the Antarctic Peninsula before completing the circuit over the infamous Drake Passage and back to Ushuaia. Um, for the first, our well, first port of call where we spend our first night is in Ushuaia. Um, it's the southernmost um, city in the world, um, backed by the, um, the the jagged peaks of the of the Andes Mountains, um, and it's a, it's a it's a lovely little town, really um, very attractive setting. Um, we'll take you into the Tierra del Tierra del Fuego National Park for a um, for a, a morning to admire the spectacular scenery down here. Um, the, the mountains are, are covered in, in, in the southern beach, home to some really lovely birds, such as the 
thorn-tailed uh, Rayadito. Um, along the coast, you'll see the beautiful kelp goose. The males are a snowy white, um, like this one here. The females are a more uh, intricately pat patterned um, chocolate colour. And if you're very lucky, maybe the Magellanic woodpecker as well, one of the most, one of the largest and most spectacular uh, woodpeckers in the world, and they are um, um, a, a real, uh, a real sought-after bird that our groups quite quite often um, see. So the cruise was going to be um, escorted by four nature trek uh, tour leaders, along with the, along with the expedition staff, two of which are actually with us tonight. There's Sarah Frost, who you just met, and Tim Melling um, as well. Uh, the other two guides um, will be Richard Bashford and, and Mike Crew, and they will have all the wildlife covered. They're great on their birds, cetaceans. Mike's a great botanist as well, so particularly keen on botany, then um, stick close to him. So we'll have all the wildlife covered um, on the cruise. As well as Magellan Woodpecker, we're hoping to see Andean Condor as well down in the, the Tierra del Fuego National Park. Um, then after um, a, a morning and early afternoon exploring the park, we head on down to the dock and board our ship for the next 18 nights. Um, and the ship that we use, and one that we always been always used down in Antarctica, and we use up in Spitsbergen as well, is the MV Ortelius. Um, we, as Sarah mentioned, we don't go for the massive um, hundreds and hundreds of passengers, thousands of passengers cruise liners. We go for the, the smaller, more intimate uh, ships. The Ortelius just takes just over 100 people. Um, I strengthen, there's enough Zodiac so everybody can go on shore um, at the same time. So there's no there's no queuing up and waiting to take your turn. Got a nice range of different cabins. Um, it's not a luxurious ship, but it's very comfortable. Um, on the top left, we've got the cabin with, with porthole. Bottom left, the cabin with window. Top right, superior, and in the, in the dining room. And they, they serve excellent food and can cater for all uh, different dietary needs. The other great thing about um, the Ortelius is that she's got a lot of open deck space. So we're always out on front. The tour, the, um, the tour leaders will always be out um, pointing out the, the, the birds and whales and dolphins and um, looking at the, at the landscapes. Um, so there's lots of areas to go out and enjoy the, um, the, the amazing views and the, and the incredible wildlife. And you ice strengthen as well, so we can go um, in or near the pack ice if if needs be. So it's a very comfortable, very practical ship um, that, that, that we found um, is perfect for, for our expedition needs. So as I mentioned, the, the route is down to the Fal up to the Falklands, Grid Ficken in, in South Georgia. And then we're not actually stopping at the South Orkney Islands, but I'll mention that in here, you know, the reason for that in a bit. Then down to the Antarctic Peninsula and back home, and that's an 18 night um, um, circuit. So we now have our provisional itinerary um, for our cruise next year. Um, this, of course, is, as always with expedition cruising, it's subject to the weather and ice conditions and various other factors. But we've actually got a really nice itinerary confirmed now for, for next year, visiting um, the key spots that we really wanted to include on our trip. And our trips are focused, of course, on the wildlife and on the landscapes and on the natural history. So after departing Ushuaia, Across to the Falklands, we've actually got a bonus landing on Grand Jason this year, so something we've not managed to do in the past, home to breeding black-browed albatrosses. Then we've got Carcass Island, Saunders Island, and Port Stanley on the Falklands. We cross to South Georgia, where we stop at Ficken, um, Ocean Harbour, um, the, the huge penguin colonies at Gold Harbour and St Andrews Bay. And then head down, we head down towards the Antarctic Peninsula. We've got an, a, a stop at Elephant Island. Well, which is a really very exciting place, which is the an island to the north of the Antarctic Peninsula, very famous for where it's where Shackleton left his men um, when he um, when he made that crossing from um, from the Antarctic Peninsula over to the South Georgia. So his men were stranded on, on Elephant Island for the for the winter, but it's also great for for, for wildlife as well. And then we've got Paulette Island for the daily penguins. Um, and Brown Bluff for your landing on the Antarctic Peninsula, South Shetlands, and then back home again. So it really does look like a very, very exciting itinerary. But we head out to sea from um, Bushwire, 
And uh, the great thing about this cruise is always lots to enjoy when you're out to sea. There's never, ever a dull moment down in Antarctica. You've got the black-browed albatrosses here, which are following the ship almost continually. And you have Tim and Richard pointing out all the multitude of, of different petrels and prions and albatrosses that you're going to see um, during your time at sea. So you've got white-chinned petrel, uh, top left, um, great shearwater, um, on the right, and then the, the little Wilson storm petrel, uh, bottom left, one of the most abundant, I think the most abundant seabird. And after a day or so, we'll, of crossing, we, we um, reach the Falkland Islands. We start up in the, the Jason Islands, um, as I mentioned, Grand Jason, top left on this map, Carcass and Saunders Island, and then um, a morning on Stanley before heading back out to sea towards um, 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 uh, South Georgia. So each day you'll go out on Zodiacs, um, the rubber inflatable landing craft that will take you up onto the beaches um, to look for the wildlife. Um, on Grand Jason, we'll be visiting um, a, a black-browed albatross colony and also black-browed albatrosses on Saunders Island as well. This here is Saunders Island, a, um, a, a very attractive island, some good um, wildlife. They've got Magellanic penguins, likely to be your first penguin species of, of the voyage. Gen 2 penguins as well, and the um, the comical southern uh, rock hopper penguin. And the Falklands are the, the place to see rock hoppers. You won't see rock hoppers anywhere else on the trip. So after enjoying the albatrosses and the penguins of Saunders Island, we move to uh, the nearby uh, Carcass Island, which is more vegetated. It still has its penguins, still has uh, the seabirds, but it also has some of the um, endemic um, uh, land birds of the Falkland Island. We've got long-tailed meadowlark here and the striated caracara, uh, also known as the uh, as the Johnny Rook. And this is an, an endemic um, that only occurs on the Falkland Islands. And it wouldn't you couldn't really visit the Falklands without a stop over in, in Port Stanley as well. We spend the morning in Port Stanley. It's a population of only two and a half thousand people. Um, it has this very famous church with a, with a whalebone arch. Um, you can explore the town and also do some bird watching along the along the waterfront as well, where you've got um, giant petrels and, um, and um, dolphin gulls and a variety of other birds to enjoy. Then from Stanley, we head um, um, east once again out out to sea um, towards um, South Georgia. Um, again, lots of seabirds to enjoy on, on the cruise. Hopefully you'll see your first wandering albatross um, on this part of the voyage bird with the longest wingspan of, of any living species. And at some point, we'll cross the, the Antarctic Convergence. Um, and this is the, the, the meeting point of the cold, northward flowing Antarctic waters, where they meet the relatively warmer waters of the sub-Antarctic. You'll notice a drop in temperature as you cross the Antarctic Convergence. And with that, you get a, a, suite, a new suite of different birds um, to look out for, such as the uh, black-bellied storm petrel, a variety of other um, prions and petrels um, and shearwaters as well. Um, and you're also likely to see your first icebergs as well um, as you start the approach uh, towards the fabulous island of, of South Georgia. Um, I was very fortunate enough to do this cruise back in uh, 2016, and the, the whole trip was amazing. But for me, the highlight was South Georgia, um, the, the sheer number of birds here, the spectacular scenery, the cetaceans, it is absolutely a jaw-dropping place and one of the, the most amazing places I've, I've uh, ever been to, proportion up to ever, ever visit. So our cruise will start with Grid Vicken, so all cruises these days have to stop first at uh, Grid Vicken, the administrative um, uh, capital of uh, of the of South Georgia, and it's the um, we used to be um, a, a whaling station. Um, but here, the wildlife fortunately has taken it back again. And you're going to see your first uh, Antarctic fur seals, which are super abundant along the coastline of, of South Georgia. You've got to be a little bit careful of them. They're a bit like, um, they're a bit like yappy dogs. They will, they will try their luck if at all possible. Um, and they're also the bigger cousins, the um, the, the southern ele southern elephant seals, <clears throat> which um, form these these sort of piles of, of, of blubber um, on on the beach. 
One thing we have to do when we visit um, Ridvican is to go and visit the grave of Sir Ernest Shackleton, um, one of the great polar explorers um, of, um, of ever, really. Um, and as they had mentioned, he, he crossed 700 miles of, of open ocean in a small wooden boat to get from Elephant Island in, um, up to South Georgia to raise the alarm and save his men. And he never lost one of his um, of, of his crew on, on that voyage. So it's traditional to go to his grave and to raise a toast to the boss, as his men uh, called him. There's also other wildlife to see here as well. This is the um, yellow, the um, sorry, the South Georgia pintail, uh, very closely related to the um, yellow-billed pintail. It's actually one of the world's very few carnivorous ducks. Um, it's scavenging quite frequently scavenges on on seal carcasses. In for Grip Vicar, we'll start our exploration of the um, of the island. Spectacular is the scenery um, around around every corner. Beautiful birds to enjoy, like these light mantled um, sooty albatrosses, and we'll take it to some absolutely spectacular penguin colonies as well. There's over the sheer numbers of penguins that breed on South Georgia is really quite overwhelming. Over three million pairs of macaroni penguins breed on the island. This is a, a penguin motorway from the, from the water up to their colonies up in the up in the tussock slopes. Wherever you've got the penguin colonies, you've got plenty of, uh, of giant petrels known as, as stinkers. These are the, the vultures of Antarctica. Quite difficult to separate the two of them. They've got a variable in plumage, but the southern giant petrel has a yellowish green tip to the bill and the northern giant petrel has a dark reddish tip. So this one here is a, is a northern giant petrel. And of course, the, the, the king penguins, a trip to South Georgia really wouldn't be a trip there without seeing the opportunity to visit one or more of the huge penguin colonies. And on our trip, we've got um, two of the really big colonies um, on, on South Georgia um, in the itinerary. This is St. Andrew's Bay. This, to me, was the most spectacular spot of the whole cruise. Over 250,000 pairs of breeding um, king penguins, along with the chicks, so you go over probably 750,000 birds stretching out there um, um, in, in front of you. And the colony extended round to the right of this photo and around to the left. It absolutely was an incredible place. And this is the spot that David Attenborough stood, I think, was on Trials of Life. Um, to, just incredible. We'll also visit Gold Harbour as well, which is another big uh, king penguin colony. We'll go down to Cooper Bay to look for the chinstrap penguins down there. And there's another colony of, uh, of macaroni penguins there as well. We'll visit Elsa Hull with its breeding um, grey-headed albatrosses and light mantled sooty albatrosses. So there's so much to see and enjoy here. And we do our trip in from sort of mid-January through to early February, which is a great time, not only for the birds, but for the whales as well. And the, the whales move down into Antarctic waters around that time to feed. And South Georgia in particular was very rich for whale. This is a breaching southern right whale. We're also hoping to see humpback and fins and Antarctic minke and a variety of others as well. And um, from the big to the small, the little South Georgia pipit is another endemic bird on Auckland, uh, sorry, on South Georgia. Um, and actually the population has been increasing. I um, mean, on the 18th of May, 2018, South Georgia was declared rat free. Um, and so there's a hope that birds like South, South like the South Georgia pipit and all the petals of the prions, their populations will start increasing now there are, that there are less predators on the island. I would also probably take you on a on a one of the day landings, they do evening landings and sometimes even dawn landings as well. And there's nothing like seeing the sunrise over um, one of these huge penguin colonies. So in South Georgia, we head head out to sea again head south towards the Antarctic Peninsula, more seabirding as you go. We've got a, um, a, a wandering albatross here and an Antarctic prion in the background. As we head further south, we start to see some of the more uh, very exciting um, polar uh, seabirds, snow petrel um, on the left and the Antarctic petrel here on the right. These are two of only three birds that have ever been seen at the geographic south pole, the other one being a uh, south polar skewer. And if you're very lucky, as we were in 2016, you'll see we saw loads and loads of Antarctic petrels. These, this is, these are all Antarctic and snow petrels with a few chinstrap penguins there on the iceberg. But I mentioned that en route, instead of stopping at the South uh, Orkney Islands, we're going to make a stop at Elephant Islands. 
um, a, a place that's not often visited on these sorts of cruises. They're great for, for penguins and seabirds, really good, very rich waters around Elephant Islands. So it's very good in particular for, um, for, for cetaceans, as well as, of course, the, um, the history of, of, of Shackleton. So as this map shows, we so if you look at the top right, we go down to Elephant Island, and then we've got our time on the, around Antarctic Peninsula, on the Antarctic Peninsula, exploring around the northern tip um, um, in the Weddell Sea, uh, um, surrounded by massive tabular icebergs and the most amazing scenery. The Zodiac cruise along huge glaciers, so incredible scenery around every corner. We'll visit this island. Um, um, this is Paulette Island. Um, ice permitting, of course, as, as is always the case. And Paulette is home to over a hundred thousand pairs of daily penguins. Um, the daily is only what two of it's two. Sorry, the daily penguin is one of only two true Antarctic penguins. It's only a daily and an emperor that only breed in Antarctica. All the others also breed on some on the subantarctic islands as well. And say, so, look, fantastic views of the daily. It's, it's, it's an amazing trip. If you're a keen photographer as well, because the, the birds, of course, have um, very little fear, which we always have to keep our distance and, and respect the wildlife and not disturb it. Um, but the birds here have very little fear of humans and we can get some, some wonderful photographs. Wherever you've got the, the seabird colonies, you need to look out for the, for the great predators of the south. The very reptilian looking uh, leopard seal here is quite commonly seen down around the peninsula in particular, say around the, around the seabird colonies. And we'll be on the lookout for, for killer whales, for orcas too. And there are five different ecotypes of orca um, in around Antarctica, each varying slightly in size and structure with different habits and, and prey. And as well as the orcas, humpback whales, these are well, probably the, one of the commonest whales that we hope to see um, on the trip. And we'll also make sure you get a landing on the Antarctic continent itself, so you can say you set foot on on Antarctica, and that's normally at a place called Brown Bluff, which again is, is included in our in our trip. And then we start home. We start heading out from the peninsula, heading towards um, uh, Ushuaia again. But we make one stop or one take, spend one day on the South Shetland Islands on on route. Often going through these amazing, huge, huge tabular icebergs. And on the South Shetlands, there we'll visit um, a couple of chinstrap penguin colony as well as admiring the amazing view and we then head back towards the um, Antarctic towards the uh, uh, American well, South American mainland again I put this photograph in just to illustrate that it's not always rough down in Antarctica you get a mix of, of, of calm conditions and windy conditions so this is um, Cape Horn in the distance one of the most notoriously rough and fickle places on the planet but on, on the crossing we made, there was so little wind, the sooty shearwaters here didn't, didn't even have enough wind to fly. So they were all sitting on the sea. So um, they don't, don't expect Drake, the Rake Passage, to be as bad as you, as, as you might imagine it to be. And anyway, it doesn't really matter what the weather's like. It's worth, um, it's worth putting up with a, with a bit of lumpy sea or two to, um, to enjoy this. So this probably ultimate of, of all wildlife cruises. So thank you very much for listening. I say join us in 2024. It's not too late. I say there is still space. Our trip runs 13th of January to the to the 14th of February next year. And if anybody has any questions, then please either drop me a message now or get in contact with me at the Nature Trek office um, later on this week. So I will I will leave it there. I will pass over to to Matthew, who's taking you on to, from the south up to the north. So I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm one of the, the Nature Trek leaders. I do this in my spare time. So my day job is with Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. Um, and I therefore have been leading uh, for Nature Trek about six years, I think. 2017, I think, was the first time I, I did a trip. Um, I did quite a bit in the UK, places like Spain. I quite like North America, so I do the States and Canada. But um, this summer, I was very very lucky to be asked if i would um co-lead uh the arctic and spitsberg and the the realm of the polar bear so i'm at the opposite end of the globe to uh to paul and um it's it's fair to say um it's a truly incredible place 
Uh, I cannot recommend this tour highly enough. It's definitely up there in, in trip of the lifetime kind of uh, category. The wildlife, the scenery, absolutely incredible. So let's set the scene a little bit. So um, we're definitely in the Arctic, but this is absolutely the top of the world. Um, so you can see here on the map, you can see here where Spitsbergen is, but you can also see a little bit further down, you've got Iceland and the Arctic Circle runs through um, the southern part of Iceland. So we are so high up, we're, we're as far north um, of the Arctic Circle as London is south of it. Um, and the, the North Pole is up at 90 degrees and we go past the 80 degree line. So at our, at our most northerly point, we're only about 700 miles short of the North Pole, which is, uh, which is incredible. And in terms of um, the trip itself, so we, we fly to Oslo um, and um, we spend a night there in Oslo. And then the next day we, we head onwards and we fly into a place called Longyearbyen, which is um, here on Spitsbergen. And um, we normally fly back, if the flights are okay, we fly back in, in the same day, but sometimes it depends on the flights and we may overnight uh, in Oslo on the way back. And um, as um, has been outlined earlier this evening, these are exclusive charters of, of boats. It's a wonderful cruise experience. And our aim is to try and circumvent the island of Spitsbergen here, which is part of the Svalbard archipelago. Um, it does depend on the, on the weather conditions. Paul was saying the same earlier. The ice conditions can mean that uh, we're kind of at the mercy of, um, of those in terms of where we can get to. So this year we made it all the way around to the top, uh, out up into the pack ice, but it was so thick that uh, we had to turn back and head back to the northern coast, came back along um, and back round the same side as we'd gone up. That wasn't actually too bad because what it did mean was that we could head out to the northwest and hit the continental shelf and head back down that way. And the continental shelf is excellent for whales. So we've got a really good all round experience by, by doing that. And this is the view as we descended down to land in Longyearbyen. And you, you could just sense the excitement across the plain um, as people got their first sighting. It is just such a stunning landscape. There was just a succession of mobile phones being handed to those who were lucky enough to have the window seat so they could take photos with people. And Spitsbergen, um, Spitsbergen means pointed mountain. And when you sit there on the plain and look out and, and you kind of see this whole crinkly landscape, you really do know why they called it pointed mountain. It's, it's fantastic. And we get a little bit of time in Longyearbyen before we um, board the boat and head off on the cruise. Uh, and that means that people can wander around the town for a bit, pick up some bits and bobs, or most people, uh, we tend to lead a bit of a walk down to the lagoons nearby. Uh, and that gives us our first kind of introduction to the wildlife of the area, which is nice. Um, there's some dog kennels down there, which is quite interesting because the huskies um, are, are quite good at making sure that um, it's not a particularly attractive place for the Arctic foxes. The dogs scare them away. And that's quite interesting because a lot of the birds have learned that it's therefore quite a safe place to nest. So it's a really good spot for a walk down here. So you'll get lots of eider duck just nesting right by the track. Uh, and you can see this one here with all the eider down, which is fantastic. There's Arctic terns everywhere, just um, flying around. Um, and lots of geese too. Lots of barnacle geese down in this area, but you'll also probably get pink footed goose, and actually, as you get further north on the tour, you might be lucky and get Brent goose as well. And that this was one of the really interesting things for me. This was really lovely because I'm used to a diet of, of geese in the winter in the UK, you know, in the sort of wide open landscapes of places like Norfolk. So to see them actually in the breeding um, landscape and see them with with eggs and with chicks and goslings and things like that was was fantastic. And you can see just from the picture here, just what a different landscape and place it is to appreciate the geese. And that walk around Longbyen, again, you're introduced to the kind of ubiquitous snow bunting. So this is the only real passerine that breeds in any numbers on, um, uh, on Svalbard and Spitsbergen. 
Um, you might get the odd wheat here, things like that from time to time. But this, if it's going to be a passerine, it's going to probably be a snow bunting. And uh, again, I'm used to seeing them in, in the winter and they're quite drab. Um, you see them in in this area in the summer and they are just absolutely spanking birds. This lovely, lovely black and white, as you can see here. Um, so, yeah, it's really a nice, even on that first afternoon, you're just getting a real feel for how special this place is. And this is the MV Quest. So this is our, our vessel for the trip. So we can take about 50 um, clients, 50 passengers. Um, and um, it's ice strengthened hull, again, a bit like uh, the Ortelius that uh, Paul was mentioning. So we can go through the pack ice um, and we can get into all the sort of uh, key parts of the uh, of the islands and, and um, see all the fantastic wildlife. It's a really good boat. I like to think this slide has all the important things in it, really. So uh, binoculars and beer, um, but it's also worth talking about the rest of the boat. So it's really well appointed, decent sized cabins. Um, this is in the observation lounge, this photo was taken. So it gives you really nice panoramic views. There's um, TV screens at each end, so we can do lectures and talks and um, things like that if the weather's not quite so good. Um, it's a really great place to watch the wildlife from. The restaurant is really good. I have to say the food was absolutely amazing. So nobody will ever, ever go hungry on the MV Quest. I can guarantee it. And you're also really well looked after. Um, so there's an expedition team and they're responsible for the overall route where we go. They do the logistics, getting people on and offshore. So it's Zodiac boats, the landings. They've got um, polar bear training, so they carry guns and, you know, they they make sure that you're safe. So we listen to what they say. They have overall control. But there is a team of three Nature Trek leaders. So there's me and there's Mike Crew, who Paul mentioned earlier, who's going to be in Antarctic. Matt Eid here on the right. And, and we're there to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And we specialize in finding you the wildlife. So lots of those Arctic cruises, um, they have a mix of things that they try and do. They might do lots of history and heritage. And actually, you don't always see the wildlife that you might hope for. And so the good thing about this is that we complement those expedition leaders really well. They make sure that the logistics are good. They make sure that we're safe and sound. They're really good all-rounders, but they really like working with us because we've got the time and the expertise to be able to focus on finding the wildlife, scanning for things, looking for Arctic foxes, looking for cetaceans all the time. So that works really, really well. I was really impressed with the setup and how it worked um, when I was on the trip this year. You can tell that we're the Nature Trek leaders in this image because of the bright yellow fluorescent hats. So this is a, uh, a feature of our Arctic uh, polar trips is that uh, the leaders are easily identifiable on shore by the uh, fluorescent yellow. For me, this felt a little bit like being given your kind of England cap. I've been given my fluorescent yellow hat and uh, I, I still have it and uh, will wear it uh, this winter with pride. And once you leave the port, one of the commonest birds that you're going to see is uh, the fulmers, but there'll also be always things in sight, brunix guillemots, little orcs, glaucus gulls, kitty wakes, things like that. Um, these fulmers, though, they often circle around the boat and they're your constant companions. Uh, and it's really nice having them there all the time. And because it's 24 hours of daylight, there are always fulmers with you. Um, these are much more smoky coloured. You can see here compared to the ones that we get in the UK. So commonly they call them blue fulmers. They're still the same species uh, as ours, though. And one of our first ports of call is um, the Nielsund area. And um, you can just see how visually stunning this place is. So if you love photography, this is definitely a bucket list place. And uh, that first morning we went ashore and um, we got all four species of skewer on the trip. So Pomerine, Arctic, Great. Um, but this is definitely my favourite. I think it's probably the favourite of most people. Um, this this particular site at Niles and, and um, Camp Mansfield is um, home to a, a couple of pairs of long-tailed skewers. Um, so Matt, um, one of the other guys, he took this superb photo. I think it really shows that long tail really nicely. 
Um, these things normally feed on lemmings, um, but you don't get any lemmings up here in Spitsbergen. So this means that they're quite a rare breeding bird up here. So it's always nice if we manage to get those and uh, we did this year. And one of the great things about being uh, on land and being out on the tundra is the wonderful assortment of flowers. Um, Tim has led this trip before. He's a fantastic botanist. We had Mike alongside us um, this year. And um, you get this wonderful assortment. Uh, at, at times, it's a carpet of flowers just blooming for a short period in the Arctic summer. Uh, and, and you get some really cool things that are really rare in the UK, but really common up there. So things like this, which is Mountain Avon, which is forming a bit of a nice carpet here with the, with the hills in the background. And another really common plant up there, you just get carpets of these things. This is purple saxifrage. Other things might include Svalbard poppy. So this is the national flower of, uh, of the area. Um, this one's the paler form, but you also get a rare yellow form too. And as we ashore, you know, as we go ashore, it's always nice to take a bit of a walk through the woods. Um, only here, the uh, the woodland is a little bit different because uh, it's only two or three inches tall. So it's, it's not, you're not going to get lost in amongst the trees, it's fair to say, on Svalbard. Um, so this is polar willow. It's uh, the world's tiniest tree. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. There's plenty of other things to see. So you've got reindeer here. And um, this is the uh, the smallest subspecies of reindeer. Um, they can be quite tame, especially in the Longyearbyen area. Um, we had them wandering up to us to have a bit of a, an investigation of who we were and what we were doing. Um, uh, you go to other places in the world and these are often herded. So these are, I think you'd probably say these are only real genuine wild reindeer out there, which is nice. Um, we also got these when we went ashore. This is ptarmigan. Um, this is the only land bird that stays year round in the um, archipelago. And um, you can see here that this is a this is a summer plumage male. So the females are white in the winter and then they go this cryptic brown plumage in the summer. But the males, they stay white year round, but they do actually molt into a slightly more dirty brown plumage. So when you see them up here in the summer in uh, Spitsburg and they look like they've kind of been out to play in the mud, but actually it's natural. It's just the way they look at that time of year. And we stopped at the research station at uh, Niels and, and um, this is, I think it's probably the most northerly permanently inhabited place on earth. Uh, and this was the only place this year that we managed to get gray phalarope. Um, we did actually get a bonus red net phalarope out on the, uh, on the sea, but um, that's not a usual bird. Whereas this is one that you would expect to get on one of the trips. Um, we had a pair, which was nice. And um, as you'll probably all know, but the, the phalaropes, they have sexual dimorphism. So the females are going to be the brighter birds and the males are going to be the paler birds. And so we had a really nice, bright brick red female on one of the uh, the lakes right next to the research station, which was which was great. We just set the telescopes up on it and let people have a look. It was good. And sometimes we don't always land when we go out. We will take Zodiac cruises and the scenery just seems to get better and better throughout, throughout the whole trip. Uh, I know it's probably not true, but it just felt that way as far as I was concerned. And um, there's just fantastic glaciers with all these crinkly edges. And um, there was one time when we heard this massive boom and some of the front carved off, which was just incredible to watch. Um, and we got to go up close to these and you'd often have things like bearded seals just resting on some of the ice flows in front of that. And one of the things that we were really lucky with this time round, this trip this year, was um, beluga whale. So they don't always get them, I believe, every single year and not always in particularly good numbers. These do seem to like hugging the, the coastline and often will be seen near the glacier areas. And uh, this year we saw, I think it's probably fair to say, about 350 beluga whales in several large pods. You don't get much more of a view than this, to be fair. Um, they tend to just roll, these white backs just roll at the surface. There's no dorsal fin at all on these things. So you just see these little kind of, it looks like boiled eggs bobbing around in the water, to be fair. But uh, it's still great to see. And it was one of the ones that I was I was really keen to try and see if we got uh, got the chance. 
And this was our first polar bear sighting. So it was a little bit distant, but this was a female and a cub that had been feeding on a, on a dead walrus. Um, they were asleep for quite a bit of the time, but we just moored up um, and uh, we watched them for a good hour or more. Um, really good telescope views and everybody was just delighted. The pressure was off once we got our first polar bear. Um, but after a while, the cub did wake up, decided to have a bit of a stretch and a yawn, and then went over and pounced on mum, had a bit of a roll, a bit of a play, and then and then started suckling. And OK, it was a little bit distant, but it was an absolute incredible moment. It was just one of those things that you really dream about seeing. And every single person on that boat was just delighted that we managed to, to see this bit of interaction. It was it was superb. Another one of the real highlights for me um, of a trip to the area is just the seabird colonies, clouds of birds. There are 800,000 pairs of Brunix guillemots, for example. There are just thousands upon thousands of seabirds. And when you're at one of these breeding colonies on these cliffs, the noise, the, the just constant flocks of birds coming back, clouds of them, it's just an assault on the senses. I have to say my absolute favorite was the little orcs spending an hour or so just sat on a rock watching the little orcs coming and going the interactions the the courtships the displays and the noise as well it's like this sort of um high-pitched laughing noise it was absolutely joyous I, I can't tell you how much of a privilege it was to sit there and watch that little orc colony it was just fantastic and wherever you get the seabird colonies you get arctic fox um, I think we, I don't know, we probably saw 15, 20 maybe over the course of the trip. Most of them were quite distant, but we did get some some close ones uh, on a couple of occasions. It's fair to say I don't think they're like me. Whichever walk, whichever group I was with, it was the other group that got the close sighting. Um, so I never got as close as this, but I did get some good views. Uh, this photo was therefore taken by Matt, one of the other guides. Um, they got one walk right past them at one point and catch a gosling. And another thing that if you're going to do this trip, you're going to really, really enjoy is heading out into that pack ice at the north of Spitsbergen. It's just a unique thing to do, crunching your way through these big slabs of ice, having to reverse once in a while and have another run at a big piece to kind of knock it out of the way. And you just slowly pick your way through um, and you can just see ice for as far as the eye can see. Everybody comes up. Everybody stands at the front and has their photo taken. It's really, really good. Um, this year, we we struggled a little bit. The ice hadn't shifted as north as it normally does. So as I said earlier, we had to retreat a little bit eventually. Um, but that was good news for the polar bears. There was um, easy access for them from the land onto the ice shelf so they could go and hunt for seals. So a good year for the polar bears. It did mean for us that we didn't get any polar bear sightings out on the pack ice. Um, the trip that um, came a couple of weeks after ours, which coincidentally Tim was one of the leaders on, um, they did get into the pack ice and they got uh, this particular polar bear really close to the boat. So this is one of Tim's photos. And I included it just to show you the sort of views that you can get uh, when you get them out here on the ice. And that pack ice is also where you look for these things. So the ivory gulls, uh, we saw several of those. And they tend to follow the polar bears around and scavenge at their kills. So normally if you find a bear, you'll often find one of these two. And another one that people are really always keen to see when we go, and uh, I was no different, and that's walrus. Um, so we got to get really close at some of the haul outs, which is nice. Um, and they're just fantastic to watch. You can see these things. Um, OK, they sleep for long periods, but when they wake up, they've got such character and they jostle around and they poke each other with their tusks and they kind of get each other out of the way. And just seeing that sort of social interaction and, and the personalities of them coming through was was one of the things that really stood out for me. And given we given we couldn't get through that pack ice, it gave us an opportunity to track back down south over the continental shelf. So where the land where the sea sort of bed drops off and the upwelling of nutrients comes up, that's always really good for, for, um, for nutrients and food. And therefore that's always really good for whales. And so you, you could stand on the bridge and you could see where the deep water was. And it was no surprise, as soon as we hit that continental shelf, 
we found whales. The first um, first ones that we found were fin whales. We'd already seen a few, but we got to see some really close and really good fin whale activity here. Um, you can see on this photo the distinctive sort of dorsal fin, and, and there's a really um, distinctive sharp ridge down there from the back of the dorsal fin to the tail. Um, so that's one of the real kind of diagnostic features of these things. These are the second largest whale in the world. Uh, and that that ridge down the back means that they were sometimes called razorbacks. And you can see why from the photo. Better was to come, though. And I think if you see this photo in comparison, you can see just what a different beast the blue whale is. Um, we stayed up all night because we were in the good area and we wanted to try and get something for the clients. 3.30 in the morning, uh, we found this particular blue whale and we just got to spend time with it surfacing right next to the boat. Um, and that was just such a special moment. And you can see the size difference between that and even the second largest um, whale, the fin whale, is just um, chalk and cheese. Um, and it was polar bear, I think, was the top thing for people. Close second was blue whale. So so to get them both was was really, really great. We saw five polar bears in total. Our last encounter was pretty special, it's fair to say. So we came across a young male and uh, we got to follow him along the, the shore at close range. He just climbed all these boulders. He slid down one of the snowy slopes for us. Um, and we watched him just chugging along gently alongside, not disturbing him at all. And then we noticed that there was another polar bear coming the other way. And this was a big bruiser of a male. He was huge, big heavyweight thing. And uh, about half a mile range, the young one just stood up on his back legs, sniffed the air, and you could tell he was like, uh-oh. Um, and this thing just kept plodding towards him. And uh, it was just sort of this real sort of tension, what was going to happen, because this male, you know, he, would he tolerate this young one at all? So the young one headed off in land and he ran, scooted past him, as you can see here in the photo. This was the moment where they crossed. And... Um, it was just it was just such a, a, a kind of a wildlife documentary moment, I suppose. And the male didn't seem bothered at first. He carried on um, heading past and then he stopped, had a think and thought, no, do you know what? I'm going to have this one. And he turned around and he just started following in its footsteps, in its exact footsteps. And the young one would run a bit, stop, look over its shoulder and then see that it was coming closer, run a bit, stop, look over his shoulder. And the big one never sort of changed pace at all. It just kept plodding and coming step, 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 step. And this went on for quite a while uh, until the uh, the young one headed off inland over the brow of the hill. The big one followed over it and everybody was just left thinking, did it get away? What happened? We, we never found out. We never knew. It was a topic of conversation for about two days after. Um, but it was just one of those compelling uh, moments that you just get on a nature trek cruise it was absolutely fantastic so that's kind of my experience of the arctic this year um it was just the best trip ever um i know paul would probably say the antarctic uh, would rival it. i'm sure it does both of them are just superb destinations if i told you i came back with about five thousand photos that'll give you an idea of how hard it was to whittle this talk down to 20 minutes um but hopefully it's given you a bit of a, a flavor of what is just a truly amazing place happy to try and answer any questions later um but that's it essentially from me and i'll hand you back to to sarah i'm going to be taking you from um bali to komodo in indonesia now this is our uh, two-week cruise which we run in september and october each year and just so you can get your bearings i'll show you um whereabouts this is now indonesia straddles both indian and pacific oceans and this is outlined in red here the whole country of indonesia but it's amazing that it's considered to be one country because it's made up of 17,000 different islands and 300 different languages are spoken here there are six official religions observed here as well and it's a real melting pot of different cuisines and cultures with many islands being quite different from one another and the country is born of fire so this whole region has been shaped over the millennia by huge tectonic forces and the slow but unstoppable collision of the indo-australian and eurasian plates 
and from Bali, which is just here. I might be able to get a highlighter. Um, that's better. Uh, so Bali, which is just here. Um, the great volcanic arc, the great arc of volcanic islands along here stretches to the east, including Lombok and Sumbawa and Komodo, which is where we're going, um, and Flores. Now, some of these are now quiet volcanically, but some of them are still bubbling away and the heat from beneath them has, uh, is still going. Um, another, you know, they still awaken every now and then. Um, all of them lie in tropical seas and home to the most diverse marine life anywhere on the world in the world with over three and a half thousand species of fish which is more than enough to keep the even keenest snorkeler uh, enthralled and a fantastic array of tropical dolphins as well now the um the arriving in bali is really a, a vibrant stimulation on all of the senses really so we've got some uh, cultural images here fresh delicious food um, and offerings which are given to um, the spirits uh, on daily basis. And they're sort of left out on the streets everywhere. The locals will put an offering, they'll put one on there. Um, and this is our hotel where we'll stay um, on the first night when we arrive in Bali before we get on the boat. Now, the hotel has got lovely chalet type huts right on the beach. It's a fantastic place to wander around. There's culture everywhere. There are hidden shrines amongst the hotel grounds. All of these photos are taken just on the hotel grounds here, um, which show off signs of worship. Um, Bali's official religion is Hindu, but it's far too animistic to be considered the same vein as Indian Hinduism. The Balinese worship the trinity of Brahma and Shiva and Vishnu. So these are three aspects of the one invisible God amongst many other gods, such as the gods of earth, fire, water, mountains, gods of fertility, rice, even technology and books. And um, the black and white checks that you see here um, are on this spiritual statue, uh, they're everywhere and they have a deep spiritual meaning. They symbolize Balinese philosophy, of uh, Benida, um, which is balance and harmony. So it's not unlike the Chinese yin and yang symbol. And we'll go for dinner on a little beach uh, restaurant, which is just actually to the left of the swimming pool there. And there's a huge sumptuous breakfast waiting for us the next morning by the pool too, which is lovely. And then we board our vessel, which is home for the next nine days. And this is a, a typical day. We'll get up and go for an early morning snorkel after a very light breakfast. Then we come back on board and we have a full hot breakfast as we move into deeper water and we spend the whole day looking for cetaceans and we'll be sailing east because we've got a lot of ground to cover on this trip as well sailing from Bali all the way to Komodo National Park and then late afternoon or in the evening we'll have a, another snorkel again and then we'll have an evening talk so we use these two vessels we typically use the Mermaid 1 which is the one in the foreground there but we occasionally charter the Mermaid 2 in the background uh, and of course, we do full charters of these boats. So it's a dedicated nature trek wildlife holiday. And these are a couple of photos of the Mermaid One, which I was on just four weeks ago. It's a really lovely boat. It's a five star motor yacht and the crew are extremely attentive. And it's one of my favorite boats to work on. It's really well crewed and fantastic. So the first start, uh, starting point of our trip, we've just left Bali. And then we start to sail east uh, through the Lombok Strait and to the north side of Lombok. Now we've barely even left before this is starting to get really exciting already because overnight we'll cross the line of Wallacea, which is an invisible line here. And this is where naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution by the process of natural selection, along with, of course, Charles Darwin, noted on his travels that Asian flora and fauna gave way to Australasian flora and fauna. He'd been traveling around what was then known as the Malay Archipelago for eight years. And he landed on Lombok and he expected to hear the sounds of you know, woodpeckers, fruit thrushes, oriental barbets that he'd heard so often in Malaysia and Borneo and Bali. But instead he was met with the piercing call of the helmeted friar bird and Australian cockatoos. And this is because 17,000 years ago, during the last ice age, the planet's sea levels were much lower and obviously the water was locked up as ice. So the last mass uh, on the west here was actually all one. This is all joined. However, there is a trench between Bali and Lombok. 
which is about a thousand meters deep. And this never went away. And it's about 23 miles across. And it was sufficient enough to allow separation of species. And this led uh, Wallace to co-discover the process of natural selection by evolution. So really interesting and um, a notable spot. So I often tell people just to feel for a bump in the middle of the night as we cross over it. <laughs> so this is typical scenery. This is the island of Satonda. And this is a, a really lovely volcanic island, as you can tell. So we've got a really gorgeous view of a caldera there. So we stop off at islands like these frequently. This is an extinct volcano, a really lovely spot to snorkel around. There's no one else about, so we have the reef to ourselves. We'll stay here for the night and we'll often wait for the sunset because sunder fruit bats, which roost on this island, will leave their roosts. Um, and they'll fly over to the neighbouring island of Sumbawa. So once in position with our binoculars, we can just sit and wait for all of these bats to leave their roosts. And they go over our heads in the hundreds. Um, and they, the reason they choose to roost on Satonda is because they're away from any disturbance by humans, dogs or other animals which might predate them. But there's so many of them, there's nowhere near enough food on the island of Satonda, that small volcanic island there to support them. So they fly over to the huge enormous island of Sumbawa to feed on the uh, abundant fruit which is growing on the hillsides and uh, as we're snorkeling we can sometimes get good views of them during the day as well just while they're roosting which is quite sweet um, and we have two zodiacs on board to run us over, over to the reefs so this is my group here getting ready to go in and um, we do this with various degrees of elegance uh, the eager ones amongst us can just fling yourself backwards off the boat um, but we do have a ladder as well um, where you can just go in uh, at your own pace. And there's always a helping hand from myself and the crew on board. Um, just next to my yellow fins there, they've got a cooler and everyone has a bottle of water in there, which is numbered. And you've got a number on the underside of your fins. So when you get off the boat and you hand your fins to the driver, they check what number your fins are. They get your bottle of water for you and hand it to you as you sit down. The service is just fantastic. So you've got a lovely refreshing drink waiting for you when you're back on board these ribs. And life under the ways is just another world and um, this is one of my favorite snorkel sites this is actually off Rinsha. this is called yellow wall um, and there's another spot called crinoid canyon and these are uh, crinoids here these feather stars and the cliff walls are just carpeted with coral and you really don't need to swim far at all to enjoy snorkels and i say to guests you don't need to keep uh, swim hard you don't need there's no medals to be awarded for going the furthest distance on a snorkel whatsoever, just float and enjoy. You can hover somewhere for 15 minutes and still be seeing new things. And it's like being in your very own episode of Blue Planet uh, with all the different creatures that you can see. We've got two nudibranchs here at the top, which are sea slopes. And nudibranch means uh, naked gill, so a nude branch. They look like little branches, these little antennae-like uh, structures that they have at the top of their head here. Uh, and these are their gills. So these are only about an inch long. So they can be really, really tricky to find. But myself and the dive guides have got our eye in and we can be spotting these things and pointing them out to you. Some anemone fish there on the bottom and an octopus on the bottom left. And a great diversity of fish, but not only fish, of corals too. So some lovely table co top coral in the background there. And great uh, variation in colour, and some of them are st stunningly beautiful and make a point of standing out on the reef to be seen, like this mandarin fish here. But others opt for camouflage, and there are two fish in this image, and I wonder if you can see them. I'll give you a few seconds, but there are ghost pipe fish here, and they are they're floating with their heads down vertically in the water. So this is their tail, the tail of one of them and the body and the head and then this is the second one here in the background incredible and they just hang vertically in the water like this and they'll sway back and forth they don't really do much swimming they'll just go with the current back and forth to resemble seagrass absolutely astonishing and this is one with a much more contrasting background so you can actually see much better what they look like uh, plenty of turtles to be found as well. This is a hawksbill turtle, but we'll see good numbers of hawksbill turtles and green turtles while we're out snorkeling. And it's quite nice to observe their behavior out on the reefs because quite often they'll be down 
eating on both the hard corals and the soft corals and they can use their their flippers just to move all the coral out the way that they they don't want and this lifts up lots of extra bits of coral and um little bits of food that they're sort of chewing up and eating and it makes a whole sort of feeding frenzy for lots of different other fish particularly uh, butterfly fishes and wrasses will swim all around the turtle benefiting from um, all of the food that it's churning up and pr providing for them and the plankton rich areas are good for manta rays which are just absolutely fabulous to see and we, we really hope to see them on the trip i've seen them on all but one of my trips to indonesia so these are reef mantas. They're about three or four meters across, but they can. We can also occasionally see oceanic mantas, which are about seven, six or seven meters. And manta rays aren't the only large animals here which are feeding on the plankton. In more recent years, we've also been seeing whale sharks. Um, so we saw them on our trip last month, and also saw them last year. And this is the largest fish in the world, growing up to twelve meters, and they're gentle giants. They feed on plankton, so they're just filtering uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton out of the water. And we hope to have the opportunity to snorkel with them too. And in fact, this is me four weeks ago, uh, just having a little chat with a whale shark, which was one of those pinch me moments, uh, just coming face to face with one, which was just fantastic. And um, this was about seven meters in length, this one. So just over half the size that they actually get to. So just amazing to think they can grow up to 12 meters. Incredible. Um, and lots of birds that we'll be seeing at sea as well, which I'll, I'll flick through fairly quickly, but lesser frigate birds, uh, lesser crested tern, uh, red-footed booby. So we're always out on the lookout for birds at the front of the boat. Uh, we'll get off a of sunset walks as well. This is Padar. If any of you have been to the Galapagos, it might look quite familiar with a similar volcanic topography, which has formed the bays here. So there's three bays and we can walk up to this lovely uh, spot here, viewpoint, to look for the sunset, uh, to watch the sunset and um, see it go down, which is lovely. And Komodo National Park, which we'll arrive at um, after sort of five days, five or six days, is a landscape of contrasts between rugged hillsides of dry savanna and pockets of thorny green vegetation, but then brilliant white sandy beaches and blue waters just lapping over coral reefs. So it's unquestionably one of the most dramatic landscapes in all of Indonesia. And this is where we're at now. So the park's located in the center of the Indonesian archipelago between the islands of Sumbawa and Flores. And it has three major islands in it, which are Komodo here and Rincha and Padar, which is the one I just showed you of the sunset photograph. So we'll go to um, at least Komodo and Rincha, which is where we have our opportunity for seeing some extra wildlife as well. we'll um, so we get to the islands early morning and the beauty of having our own private charter is that we can anchor offshore the night before and just leave the boat at 6.45 in the morning after a light breakfast and be onshore for well, five minutes later, it takes 30 seconds to run on, on shore. But then we're there before any other boats and we get ranges to ourselves and we can just enjoy the cool temperatures as well. Wildlife isn't typically active in the heat of the day. It can get very hot here after 9 a.m. So we want to make the most of the cooler temperatures and we'll do our exploring at this time. Uh, so there are deer to be seen and wild pigs as well, but wherever there is prey items, there are going to be predators. And that's what a lot of people come here for and go on this trip for. This is the Komodo dragon, and it's the most remarkable inhabitant of the National Park. It can reach two and a half to three meters in length, weigh up to about 90 kilos. And they're the largest lizards in the world. And they'll feed on wild pigs, deer, water buffaloes. Um, and it's long been thought that they kill their prey by having a large amount of bacteria in their saliva. This is true, but we now know that they also have venom glands in their, in their mouth, similar to snakes. So they, it's mild venom acts as an anticoagulant, so they bite their prey and, and wait for it to die. They'll stalk it and then they go and feed. And they don't typically wander too far, the Komodos. They can... Well, they can walk up to about seven miles a day, but they, they seem to prefer staying quite close to home. They rarely venture far from the valleys in which they were hatched. And these, these giant lizards just don't live anywhere else in the world. And they're of great scientific interest from an evolutionary point of view, because the species is the last representative 
uh, relic of a relic population of a large large lizards that once lived in Indonesia and Australia. And we'll have three opportunities to see them, once on Komodo, uh, once on Rincha, and then another time by Zodiac Cruise, where we go and see them on the beach. This is just a, a small one here. And there'll be birding to be had as well when we're doing our land walks, a yellow crested cockatoo, cricket critically endangered due to poaching for the pet trade. It's really lovely to see them flying overhead in pairs. And the absolutely stunning green jungle fowl, really lovely and resplendent where you see all of the colours just hitting the feathers there, absolutely gorgeous. Orange footed scrub fowl, now these make huge nests. Uh, and the Komodos actually use their nests to lay their eggs in, so they'll, they'll steal the eggs, uh, steal the nest, sorry, of the uh, scrub fowl. Uh, Olive-backed sunbird, uh, Brahmini kites, uh, we're quite frequent, see them flying overhead, along with white-bellied fish eagle. And when we go along sort of mangrove habitat, we see lots of herons and things, also see collared kingfisher, which are nice. And we'll look out for Cetaceans, as we're into the deeper water now, we never know what we're going to see. So every day is um, a day where we're just out looking and hoping to see uh, a splash or a blow. But there's so much excitement whenever we do see something. Um, and I spotted this sperm whale um, on one of our recent trips and it was miles away, but we caught up with it. And one of the crew on board actually had a drone with him. So he sent the drone up and... Regardless of what you, you may think of drones, I don't personally like them too much myself. But for seeing cetaceans, they really have completely revolutionized the way that we can view cetaceans. And we sent the drone up and watched this sperm whale from a screen live on the boat. And it just added such a huge extra dimension to our experience of this encounter. We could see all of the white marks around the front of the sperm whale's mouth. So this suggests this is a, an older male. And it's these white marks around its mouth are from squid. So it feeds on on large squid and the squid's um, tentacles and the beaks uh, will make these scratches around its mouth. But also it has a rake mark down its back, which is probably from another sperm whale because of the separation in between all of those uh, lines there. It could be the teeth of a sperm whale. Um, lots of other different species to see as well. These are melon-headed whales here, which are a member of the blackfish family. So same family as uh, the orca, the killer whale or pilot whales. We'll also possibly see false killer whales. I actually had a false killer whale breaching right in front of the boat uh, when I was there last year, which was fantastic, really like, quite large animals. Um, plus lots of dolphins, you get dolphins every day. Uh, so spinner dolphins, spotted dolphins, rissos uh, and frasers. Other possible species include blue whales, Cuvier's beaked whale, Dwarf sperm whales. Uh, we had roof toothed dolphin on my trip last month. Um, these are pantropical spotted dolphin. They don't look particularly spotted. Um, these, this species was actually named because of the Atlantic spotted dolphin, which in the Bahamas are very pale and have a lot of black dark spots. Um, this is a pantropical spotted dolphin, but in the tropics, they don't have particularly strong spots. So uh, they really should be called the lightly freckled dolphin, but uh, never mind. Uh, and these are Fraser's dolphins here. They get quite typically have pink bellies. Um, and this is because they don't have pigment on their bellies and they're getting quite hot and flushed in the warm water as they're splashing around. And we end by sailing back to Bali. And this photo here was taken just on our last night as we were surrounded by a hundred, about a hundred melon headed whales. Uh, you can just see a few black specks on the picture there in the water just around the sunset. Uh, and you can see the peak of Mount Rinjani, which is the active volcano on Lombok. And once we return to Bali, should anyone wish to do an extension, we travel to the northwest of Bali, where we visit Bali Barat National Park. And I'll just whiz onto that very quickly for 30 seconds before I hand over to Tim. So we arrive back here and then we drive. It's about five and a half hours to Bali Barat National Park here, where we stay at the fantastic Manjangan Resort. Um, our accommodation is stunning. It's completely secluded in this lovely lodge in the heart of the park. Um, so we stay in these tranquil bungalows and go birding every day. And this is a bird watchers extension. But if you don't want to go bird watching, then in lieu of that, you can have a massage at the spa, relax on the beach while sipping out of a coconut or go snorkeling on the coral reef next to the bar. 
we'll go out birding in the morning and then again um, sort of mid to late afternoon. And the two real sort of highlight species of the birding extension uh, is the Javan banded pitta, which you can see hopping around in the leaf litter amongst the bushes. Um, we can position ourselves, we positioned ourselves to get a, a good view of this and marveled at just a stunning plumage of this lovely bird, which was lit up in the sunlight only about oh, four or five metres away from us. And also the main highlight is the barley starling. Um, they're critically endangered and highly sought after from the pet trade, but there's a reintroduction programme on the island and they've got a little breeding centre there which we can go and visit. So I will end there, back on a sunset. Thank you very much for listening. And if any of you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat. But for now, I'll hand back over to Tim. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Tim Melling. Um... I've been leading for Nature Trek for many years now, uh, including to um, well, I've 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 watched whales and bird watched all over the world, and uh, many people do ask me where's the best place to go whale watching, and I always answer as quick as a flash, it's Baja, and uh, I hope that in the next few minutes I'll uh, I'll you, you'll understand the reason why I say this. So first of all, where is Baja? Baja, California. Everybody thinks of California, but it's actually Mexico. It's this uh, peninsula up on the Pacific side of Mexico, that great big um, uh, finger sticking down there south of Tijuana. And uh, it's about 1,200 kilometers long. It's a, it's a huge, great uh, uh, peninsula. And then on the inside of it, is uh, the Sea of Cortez, which is also a fantastic uh, area for, uh, uh, for for cetacean watching. So uh, this is our uh, home for the next uh, 13 days. The Searcher, it's a 25 berth vessel, but um, virtually all the daylight hours, everybody just spends on deck because you don't want to miss anything. And things are happening all the time. Um, right from the word go, you start to see uh, birds. I've put the brown pelican in just because it's sort of like an emblematic um, bird of the trip. Uh, you see them every single day of the trip. I don't think uh, that there'd be a day when you wouldn't see brown pelicans and uh, fine birds they are. But uh, so what we do is we leave uh, San Diego in the United States in the evening and then we arrive in the morning at Ensenada in Mexico and we have to just do a few little formalities there and uh, get our passport stamped, etc. Then we're off on the trip. And usually just within um, a, 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 an hour or so of leading Ensenada Harbour, we start to see our first uh, uh, whales and dolphins. Sometimes it's things like fin whales, um, which, uh, as everybody's been saying, is the uh, the second largest whale on the planet. Uh, they have quite a tall dorsal fin, but they always have that smooth ski slope going up to the uh, fin there. And uh, if you look in the books, it says, oh, the way you identify a fin whale is because it's got a white lip on its right side. And you think, well, how on earth are you likely to see something like that? But in Baja, because you're on the boat and you can do whatever you want on the boat, we can actually align ourselves up onto the right side of the boat and check that it does indeed have a white lower lip. And if you really want, you can go and have a look at the other side and see that it's dark. So it's, uh, you know, you do get extraordinary views. And this is a, a fin whale coming up right next to the boat on uh, on the Baja trip. Um, and uh, not not every trip, but sometimes you bump into pilot whales, which are always gregarious. You get lots of them together and uh, they do things like spy hop and tail flash, uh, tail splash. And I managed to get both of them doing the same thing at the same time here. So uh, and dolphins as well. These are uh, what people used to call long beaked common dolphins. Uh, uh, long beaked common dolphin is the one that doesn't occur in Europe and they've got populations all around the world. But when people have done their DNA tests on them, they've found that they're not a uniform species, that they their DNA is closest to the nearest population of uh, of short beak common dolphins. So they've decided now a common dolphin is a common dolphin. Some of them have got long beaks, some of them have got short beaks, but these happen to be the, 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 the long the beats, the, the streamlined ones that you get in the tropics. 
So um, uh, birds are um, uh, a, a real feature of the trip as well. Uh, this is a sooty shear water, which you see um, uh, uh, around the coast of Britain, if you're lucky. Uh, but they're a, a species that breeds in the southern hemisphere, all around the Falkland Islands, in fact, and uh, New Zealand. And then they move north for their winter, which is our summer. So you get them uh, 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 all off the coast of Baja uh, when we do the trip there. And uh, this is their equivalent of Manx shear water. It's called a black vented shear water. The vent being the ventral region at the back of the tail uh, 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 be between its feet and its tail there. You can see it is indeed uh, black there and pink footed shear waters as well. You never see the pink feet on a pink footed shear water, but it's a, a really big chunky shear water, a bit like a Corrie shear water. And uh, one of the smallest seabirds as well, the tiny little Cassin's Orclet. Uh, very difficult to photograph these. I sweated blood to get that one uh, uh, just bouncing off the water, but they're uh, uh, quite shy of boats. But uh, And they nest in little burrows, but they'll only come uh, on land during the hours of darkness in case they get mugged by the gulls there. Um, also, uh, pretty soon after you set off, there's a good chance of seeing albatrosses. Um, I've seen two species of albatross regularly on this trip. Uh, this is the black-footed albatross, which is one of the very few species that are all dark all over, uh, the black-footed albatross. But adults have got a little uh, white ring around the uh, the bill. So, uh, And the other species of albatross we often see is the, uh, the Laysan albatross. Um, both of these are northern hemisphere albatross. So they breed in the Northern Hemisphere around Hawaii and uh, Guadalupe Island, and they, uh, they they motor around the North Pacific. So, you know, they're a, a cold water species. And uh, another thing that I always love to see when I'm out there is wintering red-necked phalaropes. So all the red-necked phalaropes that breed around the Arctic um, spend the winter at sea in flocks in the tropics. And uh, again, we usually bump into a, a good number of these things feeding on the sea and paddling around. This is a, a, a flock just taking flight, but uh, it's really nice to connect with red-necked phalaropes when you, you well, when if you're lucky enough to have been uh, see, seen them breeding in the Arctic and then you see them in the winter plumage here. Um, we also stop at uh, a number of islands. Uh, this is San Benitos Island, uh, uh, the first island that we come to. And the main reason we come here uh, is not for cetaceans at all. It's for pinnipeds, for seals and sea lions. And this is where there's a, a colony of uh, one of the rarest seals, which is the northern elephant seal, um, uh, a completely different species from the one that you'll see in the Falkland Islands on the Antarctica trip. Uh, this is the northern elephant seal, and that's a male uh, there that um, decided he was going to let me get close without uh, getting aggressive with me. So I managed to get a good, nice wide angle shot of him there with the sea in the background. The um, uh, That's uh, the beach master on there with his harring behind him. And that's one of the youngsters uh, shouting at me on the beach and uh, uh, the father looking on uh, 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 unamused. So the males have, have got, I mean, by any stretch of the imag imagination, they're, they're an ugly animal uh, with that great sort of inflatable uh, schnozzle that they've got. Uh, but the females are really quite nice. I like this one just reminds me of the Mona Lisa's enigmatic smile. You know, they uh, they have a really, uh, really appealing face. So that's a, uh, and there's a massive size difference as well. The males are huge and the females are just sort of normal sea lion sized. Uh, there's a good population of ospreys that nest on this island as well, but they don't nest in the kind of place that you expect to see ospreys. I expect ospreys to be on tops of uh, pine trees in the, in the middle of Scotland, but here they nest on sort of just little rock stacks by the beach. In fact, that rock stack there that you can see in the middle has got an osprey nest in the top of it, and you can climb up to it just, well, we didn't do, but you could have done uh, with your hands tied behind your back. It was so easy, just like a little staircase going up, and you can see the ever-present uh, um, uh, elephant seal on the beach below there. Um, San Benito is also the place where you get the San Benito sparrow, which has uh, recently been split from uh, uh, the savannah sparrow, and it's now uh, a, a unique species that only occurs on San Benitas Island. Fortunately, they're quite common and easy to photograph as well. So uh, uh, I took this one when I was there last March um, uh, on the islands. 
And um, also another very rare pinniped uh, lives on this island, and that's that little pointy snouted thing that you can see in the foreground there, which is the Guadalupe fur seal. The other two are actually California sea lions, which are very common, and you get harbour seals here as well. But that pointy snouted one is the Guadalupe fur seal, and there's only two places on the planet that these uh, breed. One is Guadalupe Island, uh, which is a few um, miles offshore, and then and San Benitos, where we visit. And uh, here's a close-up of one having a staring contest with me as well they've got a very otter like face but they were hunted almost to extinction there was just a handful that survived and with strict protection they've managed to build up uh, reasonable numbers again uh, you also get um, wading birds because it's rocky shores there. You tend to get rocky shore wading birds. So uh, things like black turnstone, which is such a feature of the Pacific coast of America and uh, wandering tattler as well. They breed in Alaska, but they winter over rocky shores all uh, uh, down the west coast of America and uh, and uh, 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 Mexico as well. So uh, there's a, a, a wandering tattler. Very unusual and that the whole of the bird is grey, including the rump and the wings. They don't have big broad wing bars or tail bands or anything like that. That's the uh, wandering tattler. And uh, then we uh, leave San Benitos and we start uh, enjoying the sunshine and uh, and uh, looking out for the next thing to uh, uh, to, to enjoy. And um, on, again, on the last trip, this that's San Benitos Island in the background where we visited for the elephant seals. And just south of there, we came across a super pod of thousands of dolphins. Um, it's really difficult to get them all at once because they're jumping out of the water in waves and they're all surrounding the boat. But this sort of gives you a bit of a feel for what it's like with the dolphins just leaping all the time and I think there's one of these little rules of thumbs that for every dolphin you see above the surface there's another three below the surface that you can't see at any one time so uh, uh, I, I think the uh, the people who are very experienced at counting dolphins and things reckon that there were uh, about 5,000 dolphins in this pod completely surrounding the boat here but uh, uh, really exciting uh, all the time and so this is a, a, a wide angle shot just giving you to show you what it's like when the uh, the ocean is bubbling with dolphins but you also can get uh, uh, really nice close views of them as well because they they perform for you they leap and um, and uh, and uh, let you take good photographs of them so uh, this one i actually took from the boat that's through the surface of the water it was so glassy clear it looks like it's an airbrush uh, poster doesn't it but that was just me photographing um the surface of the sea with a pod of dolphins uh, uh, swimming below it so um sometimes it's a little bit choppy sometimes it's fine um, those were all common dolphins, and these are bottlenose dolphins, which are even more acrobatic and show-offy. Uh, this is uh, a, a couple of them just alongside the boat, but sometimes they do the uh, uh, the real dolphinarian thing with three of them leaping at once like a firework out of the water. And uh, look at this. This one was jumping up right by the side of the boat, almost as if it was showing off. And there, I mean, that must have been about 12 feet in the air for a bottlenose dolphin to come. And everybody was there lined up with the video cameras and their phones and uh, uh, en enjoying it all. So uh, here's a mother and baby as well uh, uh, g coming out together. I mean, it, 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 the, the, the dolphin photo opportunities are just uh, 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 off the scale. Now, this is the main reason why people come to Baja, because we go to uh, a wonderful little uh, uh, shallow lagoon uh, called uh, uh, San Ignacio, uh, halfway down the, uh, the Baja Peninsula. And this is uh, one of the few lagoons where the, the uh, population of grey whales comes in the winter. And they come here for two reasons. One is to breed and one uh, to mate. And one is to give birth because the gestation period is about 13 months. So it's uh, it, it all uh, uh, ties in very nicely with the uh, uh, with the grey whales calendar. And uh, the reason why they have to come all this way from Alaska, which is where they are, uh, they spend the summer feeding, is because when the babies are born, they, they don't have a layer of blubber. So they uh, they need to come down to somewhere where the water's warm and they can feed on their mother's milk. And then uh, the babies start to put on weight. And as soon as they start to do that, then they leave the lagoons and start heading north again and uh, hug, hug the coast. And that's um, one of the... Um, uh, the, the crew uh, having a conversation with a, a, a grey whale just off the side of the ship 
uh, there. Now, uh, the, there really are hundreds of grey whales in this uh, lagoon. It's quite a big lagoon, as you can see here. That's sort of just one side of it, and we're in the middle of it. But uh, And we never actually go into the back half of the lagoon because that's sort of like the no-go area for boats. So if the whales do get fed up with people, they've got somewhere to go where they can uh, go without hassle. But the whales never seem to want to do that. They seem to actively seek out boats uh, uh, to come to them. So uh, this is one that's sort of spy hopping right next to our boat. When you can actually look at a, a wild whale in the eye, it really is a sort of a, a deeply moving experience. So... Um, uh, we go out on the, the locals come with their the pangas, as they call them, these little uh, uh, boats. And we go out in small groups out uh, uh, in, into the lagoon to go and look and see if we can find a friendly whale, which usually isn't that uh, difficult. And it's often the youngsters that are uh, friendly. They only started coming to boats in 1976. And um, when they first started doing it, the, the researchers who were observing them thought, oh, we're interfering with them. And they moved the boat back. And then they found that the whale was coming again and coming up to say hello. And, you know, even opening their mouth and letting you scratch their tongue and things like that. And again, it's particularly the babies that let you do it. And this is a baby coming over to the boat to see people. And you look at this next photograph and tell me that this whale isn't enjoying it. It. look at that it sort of closes its eyes puts its fin back and it's just like a dog wanting to be stroked it's just uh you know loving the attention and when it's done one side of the boat it will often go underneath the boat and come and say hello to everybody on the other side and um there was once uh when i was there in march and the, the boatmen had tied up their pangas at the back of our boat so they could have some breakfast. And there was a baby whale that had seen the pangas tied up at the boat. And it kept putting its head over the water, looking for the people and say, oh, where, where's everybody that makes a fuss of me? And uh, as soon as we got in the boat, the, the whale was just with us and just stayed with us for hours. It just did not want to leave there um i i borrowed my daughter's gopro camera before i went i'd never used it before and plunged it in the water and got some amazing photographs of the whales actually underwater this is a baby whale and a gopro has something like a four millimeter lens so it's ultra wide angle so you can see how close i am and then when it came up again i managed to take a fisheye type view of a whale um, uh, above the water but those were all taken with my daughter's gopro camera so and it's a shallow lagoon and you'd think, well, whales are going to need a bit of uh, depth before they actually breach. But no, they breach, they fluke, they do all the things that normal whales do in deep water. But you can actually get them doing it in the lagoon. And here's a, a breaching grey whale right next to the uh, uh, next to the boat here. San Ignacio also has got uh, mangrove swamps around the edge of it. And uh, usually before we leave uh, the, the whales, we, we give them a bit of respite from us and we go and have a look in the mangroves. And uh, uh, this was on a lovely day when we were getting all the reflections. But uh, it's absolutely full of wading birds and herons, uh, uh, full of water birds. You get clapper rails, all sorts of things. This happens to be a reddish egret, but you get uh, tricolored herons. And uh, that's a black crowned night heron. But uh, yeah. Yellow crown night heron as well, and the wading bird. Oh, oh, that's uh, the mangrove warbler um, again, which is quite an elusive and sought after species, but uh, we seem to have no problem at all seeing them. So this is at low tide, and this one's uh, scampering around on the, uh, the the salty roots of a of a mangrove swamp. Uh, very closely related to yellow warbler, uh, but they've got that rusty uh, uh, rusty head, and they only occur in mangroves, and they're non migratory. They live there year round. So uh, this is a, a long-billed curlew, uh, even longer-billed than British curlews, and with that lovely cinnamon colour, and a willet with its uh, zebra-crossing wings as well, uh, uh, two for the price of one there. And this is a Hudsonian wimbrel just about to take flight. Um, it's been split as a species from the Eurasian wimbrel now because it has a uh, it lacks a white rump. It's completely brown all over the uh, the, the, the back there. And uh, belted kingfishers as well. They uh, in, inhabit the mangroves. Mangroves are breeding grounds for fish. So because there's lots of fish there, you get lots of things that feed on fish. And uh, uh, including terns as well. Uh, we get Caspian terns. This happens to be a royal tern, but we also get elegant terns there. It's just full of things feeding. Uh, then we have to leave uh, uh, San Ignacio Lagoon and we start heading south into the really warm water. 
and here we've got um, uh, uh, all, all of the uh, frigate birds over the, uh, uh, the land, landing on the, that's a shrimp boat, but they land on the boat because if they land on the water, they can't take off uh, because they've not got webbed feet. So uh, they, they, that's the only place they can land is on the boat. So you often get good uh, views of these things. Uh, that's a Nazca booby, uh, which is the uh, the recent split of uh, from uh, masked booby uh, with its uh, white tail and orangey beak. Uh, red billed tropic bird as well. Um, green turtles we get, and uh, uh, we see lots of uh, ocean sunfish, which is the largest bony fish in the world. Uh, uh, Sarah showed you the uh, the largest um, elasmobranch, the uh, cartilaginous fish, the whale shark. This is the the bony fish. And then we head down to the south of Baja, where we've got the uh, uh, the, the humpback whale uh, uh, breeding grounds. This was somebody took this photograph of the back of my head with a humpback whale just going down right next to the boat. But sometimes they flip a flop. Sometimes their tail splash. Sometimes they sort of just uh, do the, the humpback and flute right next to the boat. Oh, sorry. And sometimes they come right out of the water and, uh, and and give you a lunge. And then you get these spectacular breaches as well. These were all taken just from the uh, uh, from from the uh, the searcher in uh, March of this year. There's another breach, and that's a baby doing a breach as well. That was a little baby accompanying its mother that decided to do a breach as well. Uh, manta rays as well. Uh, we often see lots of those once we go around the corner into the Sea of Cortez. And sometimes they do jumps for us as well. Uh, it's contagious. When one of them jumps, you get dozens of them all jumping at once. But uh, they don't do that all the time. Uh, hammerhead sharks. And there is a place where we can swim with whale sharks down there as well. But it, they have to make sure that the population is strong enough, that the numbers have built up enough before they'll let you in. So it's not a given, but it's something that is on the cards that we hope to do when we go down down to the Sea of Cortez. Uh, we sometimes land on the little islands there where we see an array of birds like the roadrunner and cardinals and uh, that's uh, Scots and hooded orioles together, uh, Costa's hummingbird and the endemic Xantu's hummingbird. And if we're really lucky in the wetlands down there, we see Belding's yellowthroat, which is one of the most range restricted and rarest birds on the planet. Uh, the, the, um, uh, a fantastic bird there. Uh, we go to a little place in the Sea of Cortez called Losses Lotes, which is where we get a chance to, uh, well, we see boobies there. This is the blue-footed booby and uh, brown boobies, which both breed on the rock there. Uh, brown pelicans I've already mentioned. But you get a chance to swim with sea lions. And uh, once I was uh, swimming with the sea lions and they seemed to be playing football with a football down there. And I thought, how is they got hold of a football? And then uh, when I got a bit closer, I realised it was a guinea fowl puffer fish that had inflated itself because it was being attacked and uh, the uh, the sea lions here were playing football with it. And there it is looking very disgruntled at having been used as a football. So um, and then uh, when it's on a really dark night, sometimes we can get the phosphorescent plankton. And uh, what the captain does is he goes racing around in the in the complete darkness. Uh, and uh, that the, the, the moving engine attracts dolphins. And sometimes the dolphins are like glow in the dark dolphins that you see under the water. And when they leap out of the water, they just vanish completely because it's pitch dark. And then as soon as they're in the water, they're uh, uh, sparking off this phosphorescent plankton again, which lights up their body you can see all the markings and everything it's the most magical experience um sometimes if we're lucky we get sperm whales down there here's one coming uh, for a spy hop but occasionally we get them breaching as well that's another breaching sperm whale and sometimes we get the little ones as well i've seen both dwarf and pygmy sperm whale down in the sea of cortez that's a dwarf sperm whale and brood as well. That's a, a, one of the big, large baleen whales that has the three ridges down its back, another one of the tropical ones. But the one that everybody wants to see is the biggest animal that's ever lived. And this is the blue whale. This is a huge blue whale coming up right next to the boat. There's a, a, a mother and baby, a, a baby blue whale coming up as well. And the first blow that you see is an absolutely enormous one. When they've been down for a long time, that blow can be about 12 metres tall. And uh, because they have sonar on the ship, they, can, they know exactly where the whale's going to come up so they can position it and just tell you when the whale's coming. And then uh, you end up with a huge blue whale just surfacing right next to you. Absolutely magical. And this was me trying to make a blue whale, the largest animal on the planet, look small with an ultra wide angle lens. Uh, but that uh, uh, there's the, the, the blue whale. And there's one uh, fluking. 
And uh, this one was actually lunge feeding at the surface. So that's, a, you know, that's the pectoral fin sticking up there. It was on its side, lunging through the water, uh, grabbing a, a great big uh, bait ball of plankton there. So uh, that's one swimming into the sunset. And there's the, uh, uh, the the final blue whale in the sunset. And because when the sun goes down over the sea, you often get the little green flash. And there's the only photograph I've ever managed to take of the green flash. So uh, I know I've speeded up at the end there, but I think we were running a little bit late. So uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Tim. And uh, yeah, slightly my fault for overrunning. I got a little bit excited with my fish and uh, my slight technical hitch at the start, but uh, not to worry. I'm sure everyone's still with us and has a few questions to ask us. So please do pop your questions into the Q&A section, folks. I know we've had a few already throughout the evening, which we've been answering already. Um, there's one which uh, I've already replied to from uh, Kate George, um, but I'm just going to expand on this one. The question is, I can't snorkel. Do you teach snorkeling or what I need to learn prior to going? Um, what I would say is we're very supportive on the trip. If you can't snorkel well, we've got a really well-crewed boat and we've got a couple of dive guides that will come in the water with you. We'll even have a life ring, which you can hang on to and they'll just pull you along. You don't even really need to do much swimming. So you can just have your face down in the water and be enjoying everything that's uh, underneath you. What I would say is the, the more confident you are with snorkeling, the more you're going to enjoy the trip. So I would really strongly recommend um, getting a snorkel. It's imperative that it fits properly on your face, that you're not going to have any leaks. You don't want to be having to uh, tread water, trying to clear your mask and things like that. Get one that fits your face, not, uh, you know, borrowing a friend's might not work. So just get one that works for you. Test it in the bath or just try it in the swimming pool. Um, and practice uh, as much as you can beforehand just so that you get co confident and comfortable with it in the water because you don't want the first time to be trying your snorkel gear where the first day of the trip um and uh yeah i mean we, we usually have the first snorkel will be a kind of practice go anyway and i'm always happy to sort of pull people around um so don't worry about it it's definitely something that um is doable and i say at least half of the groups normally haven't done much snorkeling, um, if any, before. So you wouldn't be alone, but you'll get more enjoyment out of it if you've done some practicing beforehand and you'll just feel more comfortable in the water. And then you can be focusing on looking at the fish rather than thinking about your mask and, and breathing and things. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question um, a bit more fully. Um, Paul, we have a question uh, from Priscilla McPherson asking about the grading of the Antarctic cruise. Could you take that, please? Yeah, it's um, it, it, yeah, it's a relatively easy trip. Um, the I just would say that the course the terrain is rough. There are no footpaths at all in on South Georgia and, and Antarctica, so you need to be, um, of, I would say, of, of an average fitness um, or above. Um, um, you can you, know, you can do as much or as little as you as you want on the trip. You do need to get in and out of the zodiacs, um, which can be you know, can be tricky at times if if it's windy and then there's a bit of a swell. So you need to be able to to to, to move quickly when the um, when the expedition leader tells you. But I, I wouldn't say it's a difficult trip for people with a with, a, with an average fitness um, and, a, and a love of the outdoors and walking would be absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. I've got. Tim nodding there as well, <laughs> saying he clearly agrees. Um, and we have a question here from Mandy Nicol, um, asking, I'd love to go on a wildlife cruise, but I'm very worried about seasickness. Any tips to help uh, avoid or minimise? Uh, she's not specified which wildlife cruise, um, but anyone like to take that? Mm. Or I can. I don't mind. Um, do you want to do it, Tim? I can... Tim, you're, about, you're about to say I'll, I'll, something. I'll, I've, I've never suffered from seasickness. <laughs> I know a lot of people do use, swear by these little scopolamine patches that they put behind their ears. And... Uh, uh, and and that's uh, but most of the trips that I go on, if people are feeling a bit queasy to start with, they seem to get their sea legs after about a day. And then at the end, I, uh, nobody seems to be seasick. So, mm. um, you know, it's something that people seem to get used to very quickly. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. So on the Antarctic cruise, you have to expect a bit of choppy waters at, yeah. at, at some some point in, in the trip. Um, for those people who are susceptible, you go and lay down in your cabin. And relax. That's, you know, I've 
the occasions I get seasick after I've done that, laid down and just um, and taken easy and relaxed. The the patches that Tim mentions are also very effective. They do have seasickness medication on board the ship should you need it. But since he, Tim said most people tend to get their CMEX after a, after a day or so. Mm. Yeah, and I would just add to that. Um, I think if you're worried about seasickness and not sure if you're going to feel seasick or not and whether to take tablets or not, just take them. Um, because once you've started feeling ill, uh, taking tablets really doesn't help you particularly. So um, as Paul has said, um, usually seasickness tablets on board. Or if you wanted to be sure, you could go to your local pharmacy or even the doctor and get, uh, get some things for yourself. But it makes all the difference. You know, having something. I've used those ear patches that Tim was mentioning, um, and I found them to be fine. So it's usually worthwhile just taking something rather than not. Um, I think personally. And being out on deck is the best place to be, not only for the wildlife but for feeling feeling well. So um, yeah, definitely. The more time you spend on deck, the the less seasick you'll get, and the more wildlife you'll see. Mm -hmm. There's there's no guaranteeing the weather, obviously, but the choice of trip as well can make a difference. <clears throat> so somewhere like um, the Spirit Bear Cruise on the west coast of Canada, you're often in sheltered waters in the kind of the fjords area. And, and so if you're wanting to sort of give something a try as a beginner level, you know, choosing the right trip like that, there's not a great deal of swell. And it's a nice way to see um, if you're going to be OK. Yeah, that's a really good point, Matthew. Yeah. I would so say that's Spitsburg the... and also is often it's normally quite calm up there. I would, I would say Spitsbergen's really good because the pack ice actually yeah. mm. deadens deadens the waves. Yeah, I've, I've done Spitsbergen many times, and often it's mirror calm there. I've had photographs of the sea with a complete mountain reflection, like you know these perfect Lake District photographs you see. It's just you know it it really is an amazing place for for weather. It's uh, yeah. So there you go, Mandy. Start off with Spitsbergen or the Spirit Bear Cruise in Canada. <laughs> um dates of the baja trip uh i'll put that to paul actually as the tour manager um mid, mid to late february i can't remember the exact dates we've got two trips next year i think one's mid feb and one and one is late feb um if you have a have a look on our website and they'll they'll be, be um outlined there but yeah feb, february time we, yeah, february if you just... we tend to run the most of the time so we'll be sending a link, um, which you'll get about this time tomorrow, or 7.30 tomorrow, which will have a link to all of the individual tours. And if you just click on there, you'll go straight through to the tour page on the Baja uh, link, and it will show you the dates there. I think one of our trips for next year is already fully booked, but we do we do have space on, um, I think the earlier of the two has still got a bit of space. Um, oh, the, I missed the um, second half of that question, um, was how are singles accommodated? For Baja, for Baja, we have one cabin which we can offer for single occupancy on the ship, um, and then the rest we we we, we pair up people. So, to a single lady, we will find another single lady for you to share with, and a single gentleman will find another single gentleman for you to share with. But if you particularly want a single, then you need to get it early. So, just one single cabin, and they do tend to get snapped up quite quickly. Yeah, great. Um, and we've had one question about uh, photography and Antarctica, which. You've answered, Paul, but uh, asking the weather looks quite bright and with a lot of light. Is this typical for the time of year? You've answered that. But um, Tim, do you want to add anything? You, you're very keen with wildlife photography and you do a lot down uh, in Antarctica as well. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the light is usually fine down there. It's uh, very, very bright. I've never had any problems at all. It's uh, yeah, and, and the north as well. It's uh, I mean, it's uh, perfect. It's a photographer's dream, really. Both trips, both poles. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, we've just had another question actually going to the the chat, which I've just seen, not on the Q and A section from Sinead, uh, saying in the northern trip, how much daylight do we get at that time of year? She must mean Spitsbergen. And um, so this hours. is tw twenty four hour daylight. Yeah. Um, it's very <laughs> difficult to go to bed. Very difficult. <laughs> Sun never um, sets. The, 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 the sun doesn't even yeah. go low in the sky. It just goes round and round and round. It's very disorienting. It really is disorientating. <laughs> I remember being out on deck at sort of two o'clock in the morning, yeah. bright, dazzling sunlight, like the middle of a summer's afternoon and looking at a fin whale um, yeah. and uh, just not being able to go to bed because there's just so much going on. We we did the same this, this year. 
we almost did it in shifts so that we could find people stuff almost 24 hours a day and i had i had a, a magical spell at uh, three three o'clock in the morning onwards and i had three arctic foxes on the ice in front of me there was a bearded seal a walrus 50 beluga whales and a minke whale and it was just it's bright sunlight it was amazing fantastic right folks so i think that is all of the questions that we've answered um if you do have any more questions folks just email us at the office um, and a huge thank to, thank you to all of our presenters for joining tonight. And if you want to catch up on any of the roadshows from the last season, they're available to watch via our website. You'll receive a link to them tomorrow evening. Or you can hop onto our online roadshow webpage. The links to them are all there for you to enjoy. You can access that just from the, the homepage and the little sliding banner goes along. And one of those is the online roadshow. If you'd like to give us any feedback, it's always very welcome. So you can contact us at info at naturetrek.co.uk. And finally, if you're a member of a natural history club or society and you'd like a Nature Trek speaker to deliver an online presentation to your members, then we will be delighted to do this for you free of charge. Please just contact us and we'll be very happy to arrange it. So that's all from us, folks. Uh, we'll see you again on the 2nd of November.